Hi and welcome to the AR's at Records group meeting. Sorry I can't be there in person this year and um, we just have to pray that the audio on this file works. I'm Laura Graham and I'm one of the registrars at Bristol Zoological Society. Some of you may have met me before, worked on animal transfers with me or only knew me through emails about the dreaded Brexit but actually today I'm here to give almost a bit of a warm-up talk on one of the key themes of this meeting and that is the enormous value of a tiny data point and how important the role of the animal staff, vets and volunteers that collect that data is and why it's so important that we as records keepers manage it to make it as powerful as it can possibly be in telling the story of our animals. Initially we might only look at our data point from the perspective of its value at the level of the individual animal but today we'll hear talks from Liz Ball about managing animal groups, Ronnie Cowell on the value of data to stud book keepers at the regional level and Dahlia Conde from the Conservation Science Alliance at Species360 who will show us how powerful our individual data points can become on a global conservation research level if we manage them to the best potential. Okay, so bear with me on this one because, yep, I've started a presentation on data with a picture of the Mona Lisa and I'll admit that I don't know much about art and it could be a bit of a leap to compare our zoological data to something as famous as the Mona Lisa, but I'm going to try and do it anyway here. She's here purely to make a very simplistic point that a painting doesn't just appear. Beautiful things are created from hundreds, thousands of almost imperceptible marks on canvas, notes played on an instrument, words on a page, and, and data is no different. Without each brushstroke, there is no bigger picture. One of the key things that makes our data points so powerful is that they work together to tell stories, and that for me is their key value. But just because data points are stronger together, it doesn't mean that they're not individually powerful as well. A couple of stray brushstrokes can change the entire meaning of a work of art. Imagine if we were talking about what was up with Mona Lisa, rather than what the reason for her smile was. And likewise, in the context of our zoo weight data, a missing decimal point is all it takes to leave people talking about the world's biggest mouse deer and the most sensational weight loss story of all time. And the impact of an individual gorilla weight doesn't look too major. Until a missing K in your units of measurement has you pondering how a 200 gram silverback gorilla still has such impressive dominance in his social group. So our tiny data points cooperate to become something much bigger but tiny things can also make a big difference in how that overall picture looks. I want to focus now on a few examples of the value of every individual data point that we collect in that bigger picture, from individual animals to the global level, and not just on the comedy of the erroneous ones. But if you catch Hannah Jenkins at the conference, ask her more about her and Liz Ball's classic hit, Zim's a Comedy, if you want some great examples of the joy of a typo. Taking it away from the Da Vinci classics, Seeing as I've started with weights as an example, I'm going to continue with the humblest of data points, and that's the individual weight. It almost seems a bit routine and simplistic, and I know a lot of your institutions will collect much more complex husbandry data, but when you sit down and think of all of the different information that you can gain just from this 3.2 kilogram weight, it's amazing what enormous value this tiny data point has. Because this can be such simple data to record, and having your keepers enter it directly into Sims can give them ownership of data that might tell them so many things about their animals. In the right context, when it's supported by other data, a weight can be the warning sign of a health issue, an indicator that a penguin is fattening ready to molt, it could be evidence that your young gorilla's growth is on track, or it could be a sign that management changes might be needed to separate an individual animal out from feeds if it's being outcompeted by conspecifics. But to glean any of those insights from a weight, we're dependent on more tiny data points that on their own seem insignificant. So let's go through a hypothetical example now for how each bit of data recorded contributes to that overall picture and we'll start with just this 3.2 kilogram weight. To work out what this weight means we start to add in context with other data. We know this weight came from our ring-tailed lemur Ethel who is a female who lived in an enclosure with her social group and we know that this weight was taken on the 5th of March 2019. Then when we add in more data points to our picture by looking at her recent weights we can see that she's actually gaining weight. The picture's still looking a bit fuzzy, so we pull in data from other members of the group. She's fed the same diet as other lemur individuals, and they're not showing the same overall positive trend in weight gain that Ethel is. But actually, we look further back and we spot that Ethel's weight has fluctuated in similar ways before between November and April, such as here in 2016-17. As the picture starts to come together, we look at notes and her pedigree explorer, and we can see that she's frequently produced offspring between March and May. 
To add further clarity, we review ASIM's global resource, the Survival, Reproduction and Growth Report for Wing-tailed Lemurs, and I'll say a bit more about global data later. We can see that this species give birth seasonally, adding even more data points to this increasingly clear image. We check to see if she's contraceptive. Ethel hasn't got an implant. And it's also been reported that she was in estrus in late October, early November the previous year. And then sure enough, the final pieces of the puzzle slot together. Our male of foo was present in the same enclosure at the time of likely conception and keepers have recorded incidences of copulation. It looks like a foo could be behind this gradual weight gain. So the picture we were actually looking at around that 3.2 kilogram weight was Ethel's unborn twins. This is just a really simplistic example, but if you add in more and more individual data points, you build up a better understanding of that individual situation and it gives new significance to that original lone weight. This data can lead to husband reaction. If this was a species like armadillo that require the male and female to be separated before offspring are born, we can do that in plenty of time. If this was a female that had had difficult births in the past, then keepers could be ready to take action if necessary, or they could make dietary changes to support the pregnancy if needed. Sometimes pregnancies can be visually obvious, but there are times where we're grateful for the data that we've been able to collect. And using data to impact animal management doesn't just have to apply to mammals. Our team have been trying to utilise frequent weigh-in this breeding season to estimate when birds have laid eggs. But as egg development is over a comparatively short time period, it relies less on looking at long-term trends, and the patterns that you're looking for might require a much closer look. This is an example snapshot of a weight graph from one of our Sumatran laughing fresh females, for which the ER's the best practice guidelines say that no weights have been recorded for adult birds in the wild. The guidelines also state that monitoring of the nest should be kept to a minimum to avoid disturbance. On this graph, we notice an initial decrease in weight here on the 6th of June, before a slight weight gain that's then followed by a more noticeable drop on the 9th. That's then reported on by the keepers, where they become aware that this female may have eggs. We see what looks like another small fluctuation in the days following. By the 16th, keepers see the birds gathering live food and assume the hatch of a chick. Up until this point, the female's weight has remained relatively constant again, and at no point has it been necessary to disturb the nest. By the 18th, the presence of eggshells confirms the egg, but unfortunately from 17th, the keepers were suspicious that the chick was now deceased, and this was confirmed on the 20th. Together, each of these individual weights is helping keepers to build a powerful picture. It'll hopefully enable them to observe when eggs have been laid based purely on data and distance observation, which prevent them from having to disturb the nest, lowering the stress for the birds, and potentially prevent insensitive species like this from abandoning their eggs. I've included this example partly as a demonstration of what our keepers described as annoying gaps in data, where they wish there'd been more records. We've got a gap in weighing here, only of a few days, but it's enough to potentially miss an egg being laid. In this situation, it demonstrates just how important each data point is to enable us to get that clear picture. Then on the 12th, we see a decrease in weight, which is later confirmed to have likely been an egg, because keepers report that the pair have been sitting for a few days shortly after this, and they follow this up with a report of one smashed egg and two on the nest. This is obviously still very much a work in progress for us, and it's becoming clear how regularly this data needs to be recorded to make it effective. But there are patterns emerging, and I just think it's an awesome application of data by the keepers to enable them to alter their husband dream in a way that might also have wider benefits to bird breeding programs as a whole. As well as husbandry and conservation, the collection of multiple bits of small data can have a cash value too. By connecting the dots and being sensitive to changes that can signify a wider pattern of change, keepers at Wild Place have used both weight and calorie feedlog data, weight of food offer being in green on the graph here, to observe seasonal variations in appetite, allowing them to make behavioural predictions that will affect husbandry, so when the bears routinely show dramatic increases in their appetite, it allows food orders to be better budgeted for and adjusted in advance and also helps to reduce wastage. Most of what I've talked about so far has actually just been the enormous value of weighing things. But the point is, you can't make connections if you don't have the individual data point to start with. Each weight, feed log and observation can paint a great picture for animal care, breeding, husbandry and even budgets for your institution. But the value of that information doesn't stop there. We've only considered the institutional benefit of those individual data points so far. Look at how many ERs and zoos there are that have the potential to contribute data every single day. On that regional level, tags and stubborn keepers place huge importance on your individual data. 
So that's things like rearing information, accurate birth dates, parentage calculations, contraception. Ronnie will talk in more detail about the valuable information for studbooks later, so that we can hopefully work together to make our data as useful and accurate as possible for the EEPs and their recommendations. But the thing is, the contribution of your individual data points is even bigger than EASA. Together, over a thousand SIMS institutions are collecting information and contributing to a source of captive animal data on over 22,000 species and 10 million individual animals. The amount of connections between tiny data points that must exist within that network is mind-blowing, and Species360 have used that to paint some of the most beautiful pictures for worldwide conservation that I'm sure Dahlia will discuss more later. The seasonal breeding graph in the ring-tailed lemur survival, reproduction and growth report that I mentioned earlier was just one example of what we can get back out from the data that we put in. The enormous value of our tiny data point. For instance, going back to that individual weight again, so just a simple example of your institutional contribution to global data is the weight comparison report. Did you keep a realise that when he added a routine weight for a healthy gorilla male, that he would be helping it provide one of the tools that animal staff at Bristol would use to track the growth of hand reared gorilla male Hassani? adapting his rearing protocol to make sure that he was gaining a healthy amount of weight compared to conspecifics. As we saw with the Sumatran laughing thrush, very little data exists about the ideal weight of wild animals, so this data is vital for the husbandry and care of captive wildlife. In the same vein, when a vet vet nasal records keeper adds a blood result to Zims, they're contributing towards establishing reference intervals for species that we may previously have had no defined healthy blood results for. That is an amazing contribution for a tiny data point to have. Test results lying outside of these intervals suggest an abnormal result, and as such, establishing those accurate reference intervals is crucial to inform clinical decision making. Zims contains an unfathomable number of individual data points with so much variety that I couldn't cover them all in this one talk, but the expected test result resource is such an awesome example of the cumulative power of our data, I had to give it a little mention. And if you've ever wondered what a normal giant tortoise hemoglobin result looks like, you can see it on this slide at the bottom there. Last but not least, I wanted to give a shout out to the morbidity and mortality analysis, which you can find under the medical resources in the Zim Start menu. They're an excellent example of why it's important to record certain data in a standardised way if you want to get the most out of global resources, because we get back out what we put into them. If you're thinking about adding a new species to your collection, then the Morbidity or Mortality Global Report helps to determine common health issues or causes of death in that species. And that could actually help you plan ahead with any animal training that you might require, for certain tests or medical procedures that you might need to do in the future. The image on the slide here is of the graphical view of the most common health issues that have been added as diagnoses in the medical module for black rhinos. If we were to search the most common causes of death in the rhino, however, we'd find that 68.7% of the RDI records, and that stands for relevant death information, would be uninformative. That can't always be avoided, especially if it wasn't possible to determine a cause of death. However, it could also be because the RDI field hasn't been completed in either the necropsy module or on the death transaction screen in the husbandry module. For now though, we'll click on the useful records to see more information. This gives lots of detail about the most common causes of death in the species, and each of the bars on the graph is interactive as well, and it gives you a further breakdown within each category if you click on it. It's another great tool, and the more institutions input relevant death information into Zims when they post more an animal, then the more accurate causes of mortality we can get. If we're able to familiarise ourselves with the most common causes of morbidity and mortality in our animals, then it puts us ahead of the game in preventing and treating those issues when they do occur. All of these predictions, graphs and bigger pictures were made possible by the silent cooperation of thousands of tiny data points. The Young Male Gorilla Weight Comparison Report alone was built from the bricks of 4,957 individual weight records. And the more relevant, standardised data we record, the clearer and more powerful that global data picture becomes. It's not quite the Mona Lisa, and we might not see a Zim's global report hanging in the Louvre anytime soon. But with every tiny data point recorded, we can create something with enormous value to the zoo community our own conservation work of art. The role of the registrar is changing. Now often with multiple data collectors and Zims users within our institutions, we're moving away from administrating and moving towards becoming data managers, encouraging our staff to take responsibility for contributing to our shared global data. It's now our job as records keepers to not just recognise the huge value of our data, because I imagine most of this presentation wasn't new to many of you, but to instill that same passion in our keepers, vets, curators, and even our CEOs. Because without the enormous value of those tiny data points, the bigger picture of conservation fades from view. 
Thanks for listening to me say the phrase tiny data point a lot. If you've got any questions, hopefully I'll either be here on Zoom, you can bombard the committee that are present, or just pop me an email after. We'd also love to hear what you and your keepers have been doing at your institutions to harness the power of those individual data points. Have your keepers managed to better animal welfare using data? Recorded the best environmental parameters for breeding an endangered species? Have your vets used global data to improve the medical care of a sick animal? Or have you worked with the community to fill in the gaps and make the overall picture of your stud book even clearer? The AOSA Records Group is a place to share these experiences and talk about how we can get more people adding better quality data to Zims. Please do join the Google Group and let's keep talking about the enormous value of a tiny data point. If you're hungry to learn more about the Mona Lisa, that's mostly what my references cover. But for everything else, Sims has the answers. Enjoy the rest of the conference.